Hey guys, it's Adrian. I'm uh, shooting this one out more to the personal trainers, um, you know, than the home video type of people that I've been uh, shooting stuff out to lately. Uh, I want to talk about combo movements, okay, or hybrid movements, sometimes they're called. Um, stuff is cool and stuff has purpose. And I'm going to show you the difference between the two, and I'm going to talk about some 10 of my favorite combo movements that I like to use. Um, you have to understand right from the get-go before I show you anything, there is a very small population that should use each of these. Okay? These are more advanced stuff or things that you know I found really help fix a certain situation. They're not for everybody. So don't go applying it across the board to everybody that you train. So let me show you an idea of something that is stupid. Okay? If I'm trying to join Cirque du Soleil or look like the gym freak of the world, then power to you. but don't start prescribing stuff to your clients that has no purpose. Okay. So prime example, TRX, great piece of equipment. Okay. Bosu, so-so, I don't love them, I don't hate them, I'm not an anti-Bosu guy, I'm not a you know jump up and down on a Bosu guy. But I'm gonna take a movement that I'm actually gonna show you later as being a good combo movement, and I'm gonna show you how to make it terrible. Okay. So if I wanna join Cirque du Soleil, and I want to be the gym monkey of the week. Here I go. Okay. Ooh, look at me. Don't do that, please. Just because you saw it on YouTube, don't do it. So let's talk about combo movements. I'm going to tell you about each of them. If you're going to take a basic movement, okay, chin up, squat, bicep curl, I don't care what it is, push up, and you're going to change it in some way to make it more of a combo of two or three movements, have a reason for it. Okay? Have a specific population that it really sort of applies to and have a goal and a reason for it. So chin ups, for example, okay? unless you're a robot and you can do perfect chin ups and everything looks really good. We get like 10 of those. But what happens when you see people that can't do chin ups very well? What's the first thing that they do? They either kip, okay, like you see in the CrossFit community, okay, which, unless you understand the reason for a kip pull up, don't do it. More or less, though, you see people curl into a ball because they're trying to bring more of the bicep into it, okay. I'm not flexing my back by doing this. I may be clenching my lats, but I'm not really flexing my back. So a person is finding a way to get their chest, okay, their bicep, their forearm flexors, all that stuff, including their abs, to get in there. So if a person isn't quite ready for the perfect chin-ups, don't say you're not ready for it. Just give them what's called a monkey chin-up. Notice the timing. I don't chin up and raise my knees. I'm trying to get it to close as one motion, open as one motion. What you're gonna teach a client to do, if they can do this, is that when they're coming down, they should be opening and extending their body. When they're pulling up, they should be here, right? When I come down with the chin up, I'm not staying in this closed posture. I'm up, trying to open my body, okay? So I'm just gonna add something to that. Close the body, and timing, open it. Close it, open it. Champs already use a ton of abdominal muscles. Just bring it in there on purpose. Right, come around this way. Okay, let's talk about the next one. Uh, clean and press. Everybody loves clean and press. I think it's a fantastic movement to do. Um, but there should be a difference between doing it with a barbell and doing it with a dumbbell. Okay? So, barbell clean and press, when you usually see it, Something like that. You know, you could do the whole clean and press, but I'm not talking about that. Okay? I'm talking about that power clean. So, here's the big thing about that. With the barbell, it makes sense to pause at the collarbone. It doesn't make a lot of sense for the barbell to go. Okay? Because look at that. 
That's all lower back. Traps your lower back. So yes, barbell clean. Push presser, pause, okay? Dumbbells, however, you see this and it looks robotic when people do it this way. They take dumbbells and they do that clean and press. Okay? But they go here, punch, down, here, punch. It doesn't, to me, the force production is wrong. It doesn't make any sense. Not to say that you can't do it that way, you're not going to hurt yourself, you're not really losing anything. I just find it more effective for myself and for my clients to continue through the shoulder and finish the press. It's one movement. One, two, punch. One, two, punch. I am not going away from my body, okay? I'm not snatching it. I am still pressing, okay? It's a better way to do a dumbbell clean and press. All right, let's talk about the next one. This is pretty nifty. I saw this on YouTube. I'd like to credit the person who I found it, but I can't remember. This one you're going to want a curl bar. Now, unless you have technique plates, these are 10 pounds. I'd like to think I'm this strong, but I'm not. If you have technique plates, okay, 10s or 25s, and a curl bar, go to it. If you don't have the proper equipment, don't be putting small little 10 pound weights on this and trying to do this exercise. Okay? The right equipment. So, when somebody does a bicep curl wrong, how do they do it? It's usually a range of motion issue, right? They come to here, back up, they're using that lower back. In all reality, I'm not even really uncurling my elbows. Right? I'm getting to here, catching it in my butt or my back, coming back up. Trainers were forever endlessly saying, straighten your arm all the way back up, straighten your arm all the way back up. Now here's the thing, the reason why they don't want to straighten is because it's pretty tough to get out of that position. The other reason is when I'm standing here, that weight is pulling me. Okay, it's part of my back. Your body is not dumb. There's a reason why your client is doing this. They get to here, they know that that's a lot of stress on the body, it's really hard to hold. They could soften the knees, you could cue that, but if a person does a proper bicep curl, okay, my arms are straight, I'm not really losing tension on the bicep because it's not like I'm pausing down here for any length of time, but I am straining my elbow. Okay? For the client that does this, either you need to drop the weight, or once you've taught them how to deadlift, and this is a big cue, you're going to do what I call a deadlift to bicep curl. The reason for it, if you look at a deadlift, I don't care if palms up, supine, mixed grip, whatever, the arms have to be very much pulled. But in a safe way, like this isn't a safe way on my lower back, because pulling my back, it's like standing at the kitchen for any length of time, washing dishes, you're going to hurt your back. Okay? If I'm here, that's not good. If I load my hips, okay, my arms are straight, I've got that straight arm I was looking for when it came to that bicep curl, and up. Okay, so watch. Feet close. Now I can grab wider if I want to. Again, my posture has to be there. Okay. I'm going to use it one motion. Coming up, down, down. Notice right here, I have a nice hang in my bicep. My back is protected because I'm in a good deadlift posture. If your client can't deadlift, it's not for them. Get them to deadlift first and then teach them this unique movement. Okay. Again, one motion up. Can touch and go, or I can rest. Okay, just not. Don't be that guy. All right, next one. Let's talk about hyper extensions. Okay, Superman stuff like that. For people that have lordosis, okay, I have lordosis. A lot of fitness people do. If you have lordosis, I'm already crunching my vertebrae probably far way too much. Okay, I have no need to continue crunching my vertebrae in hyperextension. So what I mean by that is I'm not going to get very much out of wrong hyperextensions. I don't need that movement. But it is good to open the body from a seated posture if you have a sit-down job. So it's not to say that you should completely ignore hyperextensions even if a person has lordosis. 
but let's focus on the other muscles that posture. Because in the typical hyperextension, okay, I've got my hamstrings active, my glutes active, and my lower back. If my arms are out here, maybe a little bit of the lower trap to try to keep the arms straight. But for the most part, I'm just using my lower back. If I could learn to bring in my upper back, when I do my lower back movements, I'd be better off. So, I'm going to show you two different unique movements for that. I'm going to take a band of some sort, okay? A smart person would take a carabiner, and they would set this once it's wrapped around something. Okay, two. Just got to get this band straight, which is a tough thing. Okay, that carabiner is locked. Now, the reason why I let this go, it's not going to wrap around, fly around, whack me in the face. Just safety. Okay, I'm going to walk back with this band. Now what I want is a little bit of tension on the band. When I hyperextend, I'm going to pull my elbows down like a pull down. In that movement, yes, I feel my lower back a little. I feel my lats, my rear delts, and all my big upper back posture muscles a lot more. As far as I'm considered, if you're going to do a prone hyperextension, you're trying to increase somebody's posture. So, from here. Okay, I can't get my elbows down any lower. I don't need a huge eccentric phase. Again, don't crank the neck. If I let that go, it's not going to hurt anybody, including myself. Because I use that carabiner. Now, <laughs> pink one pound dumbbells. I bought these as a complete joke for a client who liked to whine a lot and I said, buddy, look, go use the pink dumbbells, okay? But then I actually found a use for them, which is the funny thing. So, same movement, hyperextension, right? Pretty useless. But remember what I was saying about that prone hyperextension and the best part of that probably actually being that I'm having to lift my shoulder blade, lock it against my rib cage, which is part of that whole angel winging thing. I need to take that angel wing and straighten it and flat it against the rib cage, okay? Which is a huge thing to do with the lower traps and being able to open them. I'm gonna show another shoulder exercise in another video that takes care of this, but talking about that hyperextension and bringing a combination into it, you're gonna take your little pink dumbbells, okay? If the client says they feel this in the shoulder, you need to play with whether it's prone in the hands or neutral, okay? Personally, I like neutral, Prone is definitely more effective for what I'm talking about, though, okay? I'm going to lift first like a Y, hyper pull down, dead, Y, pull. You need very, very little weight to make this tough, okay? Rep range around 8 to 15. Now, you always lift, hyper pull down, dead, lift, hyper pull down. If the person pulls down before they've even really lifted these dumbbells off, the lower trap isn't going to fire properly. It's more my rear delt that's going to hold me because my lower trap didn't flatten. So, lift, hyper pull down that posture, dead. Lift, hyper pull down that posture. Now, again, I have lordosis. I have that nice low lower back curvature. It's a little excessive sometimes. So what happens if I still feel that you, you like these movements and they think that they'll work for your clients? Cool. If the person has lordosis and they feel too much of that still in their lower back, even though they're squeezing their posture or setting their shoulder blades and squeezing their posture, first cue, just don't raise the feet, okay? Don't hyperextend so much. Still do the upper body portion. Okay, so let me show that this way. If I'm here, okay, that's pretty high. If I drop my toes, there's less lower back pressure. So, if I don't want to feel my lower back so much, still lift, hyper pull down, lift, hyper pull down, but I haven't raised those legs. It's just less lower back vertebrae pressure. Okay? So, that's a hyper pull down. That's my workout for the day, by the way. Okay. Let's talk about some metabolic pieces. Okay, some heart rate curve. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dynamax balls. Okay, this is, this is a pretty heavy one. This is an 18 pounder. Um, you really don't need a lot, especially when it comes to female clients. Not to say that, you know, chicks aren't tough because you totally are. Um, start with like a six or an eight, okay? Work up to a 12. When you're a badass, go use 18s and 20s, power to you. There's two movements. Uh, you see this all the time. Again, in CrossFit, 
Okay? And squat, walk up, squat, walk up. Now that's technically already a combination movement. That's already going to get your heart rate through the roof the whole bit. But what if I want to make it harder? Okay? Trainers are always trying to find something that makes it harder. Can I, can I, you know, kill a person in eight reps or less? So, what I'm going to do? Burpee. about something. You know what? Get them slamming stuff. They will feel so happy when they leave. Big, big, big tip. So, same idea as a big ball. Burpee, good posture, overhead, slam. Burpee, slam. Burpee, slam. Right? My heart rate, boom. 160, 180, three reps, doesn't take a lot, okay? You're looking for a good combo metabolic piece, that's it. All right, let's go on. Now, I am not a BOSU guy, okay? Just because I'm going to show you a BOSU exercise, I don't claim BOSU crap, All right? This whole, let's do snatches on the BOSU. No, please. But, say if you have a client, okay, at the stage where they can get down here in a squat and have a pretty good posture. Okay, and I spot back. I'm, I'm going in the woods right now. I'm not going to get much lower. But that can get kind of tough on a person's lower back. So a nice little combo movement. Again, this isn't for everybody. Don't throw this at your 50-year-old people. I say this can't do it, but there's a time and a place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the BOSU. In this moment here, there's a lot of posterior chain pressure, especially coming from the lower back. So I find personally, okay, this is just me and my clients, that when the front abs are working so much, at the same time that the lower back gets taxed, if I can find a way to combo those two movements together, I'm going to have less lower back pressure, okay? And this is coming from somebody who's had years of back problems. I just find that when my rectus abdominis and the TVA and all that stuff has worked together, at the same time, if I can find a way to combo those two movements together, I'm golden. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to position myself, okay? where I feel planted in here. Now, I have wicked support as far as rectus abdominis stretching. What I'm going to do, and this is not easy, so don't throw this at anybody who can't handle the posture of it. I'm gonna crunch and get out of it and squat. Notice when I sit down, my posture is still good. I catch myself on the boat suit. Okay. Now, when it goes wrong, and it does, most people, so don't use it for a lot of people. Ugh. If the lower back rounds, coming off of that BOSU, you are trying to get them to get the flattest back and the most upright shoulders as possible coming out of that position. If that's not tough enough, you can take a barbell, take a sandbag, take a sand bell, take a medicine ball, it doesn't matter. You've seen it done with dumbbells. I'm going to anterior reload this. Okay, so front load it which automatically places more pressure on my abs and less on my back. If I was here, this is more pressure on my back when I squat than this way. Okay? So, again, same motion. I'm going to get down here. Notice my posture when I came out of should not be used for a lot of things and this should not be used for a lot of people. Look for something cool, something at least add some proper, you know, function, even just having a reason for what you're doing. I'm trying to get my abs again to work while my lower back is being stressed, therefore in total my lower back is stressed less. So, let's move on. Ab wheel roll-ups, I love ab wheels. That's nine dollars probably anybody can spend, but huge problem, right? One, and not that I haven't seen it, I've seen it. 
the ab wheel roll up from the feet. It's probably way too tough for 99% of people. Plus, I can't get out that far. Plus, the risk of injury, probably way too much. But you know what? I love these guys who take the ab wheel, get really good at it, and then start bumping out five sets of 20. Okay? Because they, they got good at it. What benefit are you getting out of it anymore, man? Find a way to make it harder. So here's the thing, I'm going to fix a little bit of a problem that I find with the ab wheel as far as tension on the abdominals goes. So when you look at a proper ab wheel roll-up, first off, and I'll do a whole series on extension-based or anti-extension-based training as far as the abdominals go. Okay. When you start off with an ab wheel, you should be over top of the wheel. If I'm here, I'm chilling out, my abs are dead. If I'm here, okay, they're slightly engaged. Second thing when it comes to the abdominals is some people when they do the ab wheel they feel their lower back like, like oh my lower back every time I get out there. Well yeah if I start like this, okay there's a time and a place for that, but surely isn't in the gym. If I'm starting with this curvature in my back, you're pretty much sending your client up to kill their lower back to begin with. So first tip from here to there. Okay? What did I do? I crunched my abdominals already. They're not really flex, but I did close them, so they're going to flex better. So, from this position, and this is, you know, one of the rare exercises that this posture actually helps. At least when I get out there, I'm not like this. Okay, torturing my lower back. Now, I can kiss the ground for 20 of these. Whee! 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 How many of those do you need to do? Where you make it tough. The reason why it's not tough is because it's super hard when I get out here, really easy when I get back here because my abs are off. My stomach is relaxed. So I'm going to teach you a way. This is a combo movement. Hey, really small thing. It's going to help you keep tension on the abs and drop your reps from 20 of these to 10 of these. Okay? I call it an ab wheel rollout to plank pike. Couldn't think of a better name. Okay? I'm going to roll out. Ooh, and as soon as I get there, I'm up, right? I have to hold my abdominals, my hip flexor, my rectum, everything is tight. Down. Uh. 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 I'm up with the knees, down with the knees, out. on the abs and stop doing 20 reps of these if you can do that. All right. Last one, number 10. Heart rate sweating, you don't think much. All right. You saw that push-up. It's a plyo knee tuck. My feet in the TRX, hands on the BOSU. So why is that a bad idea? All right, looks cool. First off, if I'm going to do something plyometric, I probably don't want my wrist in a position where they're going to move around on this BOSU and I could slip, crack my skull. Okay. Plus, it's just pretty unstable for my shoulders. Not that that's a bad thing. Like, I don't mind, you know, doing BOSU push-ups or even, you know, like a slammer push-up. But comboing it with a T-Rex knee tuck, jackknife, backflip, there's no point. But I do love, and again, you have to have a reason for putting a combo movement together. I do love push-up to plyo knee tuck. Okay? So what that is, push-up and jump the knee tuck. Step back. Don't jump back. The reason that I love that is because when you do a push-up, generally we're trying to train the chest, the shoulder, front shoulder especially, and the tricep. There's a few other muscles that get in there, right? Like as far as your core midsection goes, you know, I've got my obliques, my hip flexors, all that stuff's engaged. The one that gets forgot though is the serratus anterior, this big rib cage muscle. And you see women that can't do push-ups properly, okay, where they're here and they sink in. I'm trying to think about what muscle will get them to stop doing that. Okay, so what is it? If I go from here and I push up, I haven't moved my triceps, they haven't extended any further, my chest is closed a little bit, front shoulder a little bit. This is that muscle, that serratus anterior. Okay? So when I get in here, some people you've seen a push up plus, push up plus, that extra reach is that serratus. Great combo movement, really boring. In that position, okay, mid-air, obviously I'm going to finish here, but mid-air, 
I am pushing as hard as I can through my serratus. Now, in a certain circumstances, I'm going to take a lady, or especially a young lady, who can't do push-ups very well, and I'm still going to let them do half range, as long as it's a good half range push-up. Any tuck. Okay? Not the melting candle push-up. Any tuck. A proper half rep. Any tuck. I'm still going to let them do that. Again, because the combination of it allows me to really work that serratus interior. Also, coming out of that knee tuck, okay, I'm going to want to open my body. Because again, that fixes that problem of that melting candle closure, and I'm going to open the ribs. Tuck in. Back, back. Open. Tuck in. Okay? All I'm saying is, combo movements look cool, they're fun, they're really hard to do, I'm sweating like a pig, you know, awesome. High five, here's your 50 bucks. But, have a reason for it. Don't just make a push-up different or harder because it's different or harder. Okay, especially with certain populations. If you're not great at push-ups, why are you making them do, you know, negative push-up to burpee knee tuck backflip? Why? Doesn't make any sense. Have a reason for it. I'm gonna shoot up some more videos of your combo movements. Any questions, let me know.